Okay, it is Thursday again. I feel like sometimes weeks fly by, but welcome everybody. My name is Terea Rodriguez. Um, I am a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. I am joined today by a wonderful colleague, Cindy Bloomfield. And today we you, you get to kind of eavesdrop in on a little practitioner conversation. We're going to talk shop about elimination diets. Um, Cindy, why don't you give the gals who are watching this both live and on the replay an idea of your background and just who you are? Sure. So I, my, I have a PhD in natural and integrative medicine, but I, by training and trade for years, was an exercise physiologist and a nutritionist. So I teach college, um, part-time nutrition. Before that, I taught full-time nutrition. And then after the PhD, I decided I would kind of go into more functional type medicine. So I've worked at alternative health clinics, functional medicine clinics. I'm currently at a neuropathy center because if you have ever had neuropathy, hopefully you were told that it's not a condition. It is something systemic going on. So they brought me in to try to figure out what could possibly be causing some of these patients' neuropathies? And yeah. I work with kids, ADHD, and autism spectrums. I kind of freelance, so I do a little bit of everything, private clients, and partner with clinics that need a functional medicine piece. And someone to go over those labs, because you'd be amazed at how many doctors run labs and they don't know what some of them mean. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. It takes, it takes time to study these labs and really understand not only what do the results mean, but wh what methodology is the lab using to begin with? That's a lot of information right. that I'm interpreting to understand the pros and the cons and how that relates to everything else that we're seeing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So today, I mean, you and I met because we started jamming on this topic of el elimination diets, and we both have a very similar view, which is there's a time and a place, but there's a lot of hidden downsides to the elimination diets that I think people are not aware of when they first get told, hey, you should try an elimination diet, or hey, you should try low FODMAP for that. Um, let's first talk about what would you say is the most appropriate time and place to actually execute elimination diet? And for how long would you recommend that to one of your patients, for example? You know, I think the only time I've ever actually recommended any kind of an elimination diet is if somebody came to me and said, I know I'm reacting to something I'm eating. I just can't figure out what it is. Like they were so in tune with their bodies. They knew that they got worse when they ate certain things. And the best way to describe it probably is just to give you some examples. I had yeah. a patient once who said, I have had this horrible hip pain for years horrible hip pain only on the right side and I've noticed over the years I've gone to a chiropractor it's helped a little bit I've done all these different things I've done these anti-inflammatory diets and what she said to me was I noticed when I did this anti-inflammatory diet I got worse and I said well tell me what you mean by that well I was doing all these you know anti-inflammatory berries and I was doing these anti-inflammatory foods from all the handouts they gave me I was juicing all these vegetables I got worse and then I also noticed when I ate certain meats, I would get worse. So I said, you know what? Let's break this down and take out the things that you're eating the most often. Let's just, you know, maybe one at a time, take these things out and see if it works. And she got better. So then I said, you know what? Let's do a food sensitivity test and just see if there's something there. And the foods that she was the most reactive to were the things she was eating every day. Yes. She had brought in more fish. She had brought in more chicken. The vegetable that she was juicing all the time, like multiple times a day, she was highly sensitive to. So, you know, I think there's a time and a place, but it's not the thing I'm going to try first. Just start taking all these foods out. I have had a couple of instances where somebody would come in. This would be in the um, neuropathy center where they would come in and the doctors would look at them and say, there's nothing structural here. So we can't do anything for you. Go see Cindy and see if we can figure something out. And before we ordered any labs or whatever, I would say something like, you know, try, you're eating a lot of dairy or you're eating a lot of gluten. Take one of those out and just see what happens. Right. I had one patient came back and he said, I'm fine. We fixed it. It was the dairy. All of my neuropathy went away when I cut out the dairy. 
Fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think elimination diets tend to be for a lot of practitioners, the very first thing that they go to, because of course we want to make sure that people are eating good food, healthy food, etc. And if we're trying to take out foods that are known to be inflammatory, like gluten, dairy, sugar, right. that's kind of my, my top three, right? <laughs> right? I'm always talking about gluten, dairy, sugar. Um, and so they prescribe an elimination diet. Sometimes it's only specific to a certain thing like gluten. Um, but in my space, I see a lot of people with autoimmune disease or suspected autoimmune disease. They get these other m- much more rigid elimination diets prescribed to them like AIP or low FODMAP yeah. type diet. Um, and in my opinion, that's useful if it's done for a short period of time, yeah. six, eight weeks at, at max. And it's useful to see if certain foods were driving the inflammatory pathway for that person. Right. But now I'm going to get into some of the downsides. The downsides are that sometimes they don't get instructions on how to add foods back in properly. Um, They notice that they're feeling better. So they become afraid of adding foods back in Um, or they just feel like, well, AIP is the autoimmune diet. I have autoimmune, therefore I need to eat this way for a lifetime. And that leads to other issues. Are you seeing, you're seeing in your part of the world and, and that kind of thing, are you seeing something similar? Yes, because before this, I worked at a clinic where I worked um, as a nutritionist and they, the way they did it was we had to sort of follow a protocol. And so it was this cookie cutter. Everybody got the same handout and it's not the way I like to operate, but we were all supposed to do the same thing. And these diets would get so restrictive. People would come in telling me, well, you know, I have to eat this way for forever. And then there was all this stress around not being able to ever go back to enjoying a meal that was forbidden. And so that was really the main thing I saw was all the stress around it. And then we were telling moms of children, you got to cut this out and this out and they can't ever eat this again. And some of these poor kids, they weren't going to do it. And so now all this stress is on the mom over food. Right. Right. And the, the stress leaks into um, fear, right? They develop this fear around foods. And I remember when I did AIP, I'd be like petrified if a tomato might show up on my plate (laughs) at a restaurant. And, you know, at first it was, I I just accepted that as that was my new reality. And then I kind of woke up and was like, whoa, wait a second. Like, I know that tomatoes have a lot of really good micronutrients in them. And do I really need to be that concerned about this particular nightshade for autoimmunity? That's really got me to question these kinds of things. And the more I work with autoimmune, the more I see disordered eating in this way. Yeah. And it spreads to other areas of their health. So now there's this like, I don't want to say obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not that. But there is definitely a mental health component to it that this is one of the dangers that I really see is people are being told, do this kind of diet, but they're not (laughs) being told that, okay, it's fine if you do it 80% of the time and 20% of the time, it's okay if you make mistakes, like (laughs) 80-20, like there is a reason why Parade of Principle works, right? 80-20. Um, because that stress over that last 10% or that last 20% is the stress that you're talking about. They're like really white knuckling that last bit. And that's more dangerous if you think about it from a adrenal standpoint and a nervous system standpoint, like that's way more damaging than the tomato. Exactly. Yes. And the other thing that I noticed too was, Let's take gluten, for example. Yeah. Someone tries to remove gluten, and a lot of times I'd have a patient come in for a follow-up, you know, maybe two weeks after, and they're eating all this gluten-free processed junk. And I'm thinking, you know, I think I'd rather you just have, like, some organic sourdough bread than have all this processed gluten-free junk. And so 
then they would shift to that. And their diet was actually worse because they were, they just started loading up with gluten-free junk and corn chips. And, you know, can we put a piece of whole food in there somewhere? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that and bring up the, the whole processed food side, because when we start giving food labels like gluten-free or um, Whole30 or yeah. paleo, whatever that happens to be, people get lost if, first of all, the rules are complicated, right? <laughs> so they're trying to memorize these rules. They go to the store, they get lost. And now, A, it's a good thing, but it's also, we've made this um, advancement in our, in our food labeling, but it's also a bad thing. So, you know, before there wasn't a label that said Whole30 compliant. There wasn't a label that said gluten-free. We would literally have to read all the actual ingredients and have to translate some of those because who knows, like is soy sauce, like it, does, <laughs> does that really have gluten in it? I'm not really sure. Um, and, but now there's the labels and the labels come on processed food. Exactly. Right. So it's like they look at the box and there's that. Oh, I recognize that whole 30 icon. Yes. And is it necessarily the best choice? Probably right. not. No, yeah. probably not. I just like to go back to the basics. You know, who, who coined the phrase eat food, mostly plants? Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan. I eat like food, that. not it's too mostly, much, mostly plants. Mostly plants. Yeah. I, he needed to add in, eat real food, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. That's so simple. It is very simple. It's, um, and it's, it's, <laughs> aside from elimination diets, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that we don't talk about a lot is how do we make this simple? People come into health trying, there is something's going on with them. They want to improve their health. One of the very first places that they get pointed towards is to take a look at food. And what we've done, at least in this country, what we've done is we've made it really complicated and mm -hmm. added a whole bunch of processing to a lot of the different foods and have forgotten to educate even our grade school kids. Like they can't recognize what a carrot looks like. Right. And so, you know, starting to bring some of that simplicity back of what is, what does simple food look like? It looks like what it comes out of nature is what it looks like. It doesn't come in a box or a bag. That's usually <laughs> what I tell my clients is if it's in a box or a bag, question whether or not it's, Absolutely. it's highly processed because it probably is. Right. You know, it's amazing. I get, this is what I get all the time. Um, well, what are we supposed to do? Eat grass? And I, I read somewhere that if you tried a new plant food, whether it's an herb or a vegetable or a fruit, whatever it is, but a plant food, you try a new one every day in your lifetime, you won't get to all of them. Yes, there's, there's that a, many foods. Them, but we're so stuck on, you know, well, I eat green beans and I eat corn and they consider corn a vegetable and their green bean is their vegetable. And after that, what are we supposed to eat? How am I supposed to get more whole food veggies then? There's, we're kind of, we've got this tunnel vision with there's just nothing out there to eat if I'm not eating all this processed stuff. And again, a lot of that has to do with the way that we have commercialized the food system here in the United States. And, and, uh, don't get me wrong. I love natural food stores, but even they are um, subject to the same issue, which is the person who's in that produce department is only really offered a very limited amount of um, produce to be able to order. And then that's what shows up in the shelves. And so, you know, when I started going to farmers markets, I had no idea how many different varieties of lettuce I could possibly get or how many different varieties of kale. I was used to seeing one version of kale in the store. Exactly. And then, you know, throughout the summer, I'm seeing this like purple kale and I'm seeing like frilly kale and I'm seeing different colors and it's just all these different types. And I'm like, where are these things coming from? And half of the vegetables I wasn't even able to recognize back exactly. then when I started going. <laughs> what is a rutabaga, <laughs> right? That's what I look like at the, I looked at the sign uh -huh. and I, A, tried to pronounce it, couldn't, 
B, what is that? It looks weird. It's got these fingers sticking out of it. How do you cook it? How do you eat it? And now I see it in my farmer's market box and I'm like, yes, this is so great. I get some purple rutabaga this week, you know? So, yeah. Oh, that's funny. The, you know, one of the other things that I don't like about these prescribed elimination diets, especially when somebody ends up on them for a long period of time, is you and I both know how important the microbiome is. Mm -hmm. And one of the key pieces to having a very healthy microbiome, a healthy gut, a healthy immune system, a healthy body, is having a lot of variety in that microbiome. And when we are minimizing our foods, some of those really good populations like Archimancia and that kind of thing that up until very recently, you couldn't actually get in a commercially available probiotic to replace, um, they starve and then they go away. Right. Um, so when you see people on elimination diets, are you running any kind of microbiome analysis or stool testing on your clients? Yes. And are you seeing major voids like I am? I'm seeing, so there's, I'm glad you brought that up because I kind of say this tongue in cheek, but I almost, I almost just quit doing stool tests because they all look the same. I'm seeing the same yeah. thing with all the, with my sickest patients. They don't have the diversity the, the two, not enough of the beneficial bacteria and, I, and it gets worse if I do a before and a after stool test, if they go on one of these elimination diets. And the one that I see impacted, that has impacted the labs the most are the low carb diets. So someone mm -hmm. goes on one of those and the gut microbiome, it doesn't take long to change and it changes dramatically, not in their favor. And then we're starting all, we're, we're, we took three steps back when they start doing some of these elimination diets. And I've even seen um, insulin resistance get worse. I've seen cholesterol get worse, the LDL yep. cholesterol, the triglycerides. I've seen all of that get worse in a very short period of time by doing these elimination diets. Yeah. And part of me feels like, the, I think the draw to some of those is they think they're going to get some changes quick. And so everybody kind of will condition for that instant, you know, quick fix. But they're not looking long term down the road at what happens six months, one year, two years, three years later, the residual damage from that, you know, if they do it for eight weeks or so and they get a kickstart, but then go back to eating normal whole foods. Okay. If you want to do a kickstart, go for it. But when they're yeah. doing this, for, you know, year after year, month after month, and I'm seeing these labs change so much. And it's amazing that the diabetic patients that I work with, a lot of them tell me their neuropathy gets worse. Like everything got worse. Maybe yep. for a month it got better. They felt better. But then all of a sudden it comes back with a vengeance. It does and come it back with a vengeance. The weight piles back on that. with the vengeance. All of that stuff happens with a vengeance. Yes. And something that I see a lot are these pockets of, you know, depending upon what style of diet they were on, a paleo type diet or an AIP or whatever that happens to be. Um, or somebody with lots of food sensitivities and they've lost oral tolerance and now they're down to five right. foods. This is where the gut gets to be in its worst position because so many of these beneficial bacteria are responsible for keeping inflammation low. And if, right. if, if wait, let's think about this. And if we're illness is them. caused, <laughs> Yeah, if illness is caused by increasing inflammation, but we're killing the microbiome, species that are responsible <laughs> that controls that what is happening right and that's exactly what i see and so i'm just seeing these like gaping holes of lots of different species that need to be there and they're not species that you can find in a probiotic bottle right. and that's right. the piece that i think people are missing they're like oh but i take my high dose probiotic and it's uh, yeah that's great <laughs> <laughs> and and it's exactly. not going to do yeah. enough. And so the, and I think sometimes we get there because if we talk about human nature for a second um, and we look at AIP and that list, you've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it. What's the first thing that somebody does is they're like, okay, so if I, 
get bro broccoli. Okay, good. Coconut oil. I can have coconut oil. Chicken. Okay, cool. Cool. Dinner. Chicken, broccoli, coconut oil. Coconut oil. Done. On repeat. Every night. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because that's just how we think. It's like, okay, cool. Now I know what to eat. And then I'll just do that over and over again. And I'll be compliant. But now we've taken the um, whole very restrictive AIP and made it, we've, we're down to three foods. Right. Right. And yeah, that can definitely be damaging. Absolutely. For sure. and I've seen, have you seen the short chain fatty acids just pretty much go away? With these, with yes, these and I'm only grinning ear to ear because I recently started using, um, in the last year, I've shifted over to using a microbiome test from microbiome labs called BiomeFX. And in that lab itself, it actually gives you a readout of your microbiome, how much butyrate is it producing and how much acetate is it producing. All these wonderful right. short chain fatty acids that we get that the microbiome creates that we need, <laughs> um, you know, are they doing any of that work? And um, it, it really helps my clients recognize, oh gosh, okay, maybe I do need to shift in some of the fibers that I'm including in my diet and some of the different types of vegetables that I'm including in my diet. So we can grow those species because Man, with somebody devoid of butyrate, they're suffering. Oh, yeah. Yes, they are. And th they have a job. They have, they're supposed to be there. There's a job they're supposed to do. And you can't, you know, a, a, a large company can't do a job with just three workers. You've right. got to have all of the employees there to do their specific jobs. Such a great analogy, right? I mean, we really are an ecology. We just yeah. are, and we need to have all of those different species together so that the competition isn't fierce, it's in balance. Um, you know, and it, it, it's really been eye-opening to study the microbiome at this level to start to see how much, of, how much of these employees that you're talking about, some of them are responsible for vitamin generation. Mm -hmm. And so the vitamin B12 that we're supposed to be getting from our multivitamin or our diet may not actually be enough because we need that microbiome to help generate some of that as well. Right. So, right. yeah, it's so, so, so important. And I think those are really, do you see any other major downsides to elimination diets in your practice besides those two major buckets? Those are the main ones that I see, but, you know, I guess the, the third one, there's always, it always brings on so much stress. They, they get stuck in this mindset, is that I have to do it this way, and they, they're not free then to enjoy the foods they used to eat. That's yeah. probably the third thing I see is just all of the stress that goes around. It makes people kind of neurotic sometimes, and that's not healthy either. I mean, stress yeah. breeds inflammation, so we don't want to yeah. add add to the inflammation just from that mental component. And pre-pandemic, um, I think, yeah, definitely pre-pandemic. And it's starting to get to a place now where we can start having social meals with people. Mm -hmm. Being social over meals is, I, I think, imperative to health. So if you start looking at these blue zone populations, the um, centenarian populations that are associated with longevity, like, like they're living to a hundred years, but they are bright, they're able, they are right. walking, they are living their best life at a hundred plus years old. If you study those, one of the major components that they found that contributes to that is social enjoyment over meals. Yep. Not just being social, but social enjoyment over meals. And when we get into these strict rules of like, I can only eat this stuff, I can't go to that restaurant, I can't enjoy, you know, lunch with a girlfriend, I can't go out to eat with my family, it becomes isolating. Right. And that is not good for anybody's health. I mean, look at the um, increase of mental health issues just from the isolation that we've had during the pandemic. Yep. You know, I talked to a um, psychologist the other day who told me that they're seeing so many new patients, middle school and teenage kids, 
from this pandemic and the isolation that you can't get an appointment in because so many of these kids are just begging for help because they're so isolated. And that's just yeah. been in the last year. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what elimination diets tend to do to us socially. It's a downside that, you know, they're like, here, try, try some new food and try an elimination diet, but they're not saying, Oh, by the way, you're right. going to be socially isolated. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to become neurotic over your food and your microbiome is going to suffer. Exactly. It's, it, it's almost to a point where um, the overuse of elimination diets gets me a little bit on the um, <laughs> irritated, angry side. Cause it's like, oh. can we please just have informed consent <laughs> on everything? <laughs> because I think people should know because it's, it's a, tr it's not a trap. It's just, it's a pothole that you might hit. Yeah. And um, knowing about that ahead of time, I think is, it would be beneficial. Right. Um, I mean, which is go into it knowing eyes wide open, what the consequences are going to be. You know, the first time right. somebody comes in and says, you know, I tried this elimination diet, whatever it was. And I noticed I got constipated. I couldn't sleep well. I'm like, go off. Please go off that elimination diet because this is making you worse than what you were originally trying to solve by going yeah. on in the first place. Yes, exactly. And, and I think I, this is one of the reasons why I talk about this so much. It's because I've seen so many women suffer from just the, the notion of being told that an elimination diet is the answer to your health problems. And it's something that you're going to need to be on for life. And I don't necessarily think that in those cases, it's done them any good. Right. I will say, I have definitely met people who have tried an elimination diet. It solved a ton of their health issues. They were able to later on reintroduce the majority of those foods back and they've gotten really good health, but it's not the, it's not the top major portion right. of the bell curve. Yeah. That's, That's the part. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's almost like we expect that to be the top portion of the bell curve. Like everybody who does the elimination diet is going to feel amazing. And really, it's like, it's the outlier. It's the outlier. I was about to say that. Yeah, they're usually the outliers. At least that's what I've seen. Yeah, yeah. So um, anything else that you want to say about elimination diets? And then we'll wrap this up. Gosh, I don't know. I think we've covered. I think we've covered all the things I've been about on a regular basis. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So anybody who's watching live or replay, you can always put question into the comments. Um, I will make sure that those questions get answered. Um, where can people find you? I know you've got your Facebook page that I've got the address for, but let people know kind of where they can find you if they want to have a conversation with you or talk to you about maybe working together or something like that. Yeah. So my, you've got my um, Facebook page. It's My Health Fluency. And then I'm on Facebook, Cindy Bloomfield. But I'm also on the website for U.S. Neuropathy Centers. So that's primarily where I do most of my um, visits. Other than that, um, people have Googled me. <laughs> Fantastic. Me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate you coming on this afternoon and having a little bit of practitioner chat, work chat. And um, we'll, maybe we'll find another topic and have you on some other time. Yeah, sure. Okay. That yeah, was fun. Thanks for having me. Sure. Good night, everybody.